Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast. I'm your co-host, Lolita, also joined by Kyle. On the show with us today, Derek Dickerson. Derek, thanks for being on the show. How's it going? Good. Thanks for having me. Great. Uh, Before we get into the interview, here's a little bit about Derek. Derek works for the firm Rice Insurance and specializes in insuring multifamily properties. He writes all lines of insurance for multifamily investors and property owners. This includes everything from property and general liability to professional policies such as employment practices, tenant discrimination, directors and officers, and so on. Derek currently insures north of 30,000 units in 15 different states. So super great. I know a lot of our listeners will learn from your expertise in the insurance world. So before we get started, Derek, could you please tell the listeners a little bit more about yourself and what you currently do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you did a nice job summing me up there. Uh, to start. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, name's Derek Dickerson. I work at a firm by the name of Rice Insurance uh, based out of Seattle, Washington, in the Northwest. Um, and yeah, pretty much the backbone of our firm is, is multifamily property and casualty insurance. Um, we were uh, first founded in 1946 um, and really started out more as your local mom and pop shop for the last, you know, for the first 50 years or so. And then about 15 years ago, um, uh, the CEO of our company, James Fritz, actually began what's now our commercial real estate division. And um, since then, our, our company actually has grown um, pretty substantially, especially over the last five years. We've grown 20, over 20% the last five years. We've been named to Inc. Magazine's top 5,000 um, fastest growing companies uh, in the country, which if you know anything about the insurance industry, it's uh, somewhat of an archaic business as far as the independent agency is concerned. And, and so it's, it's, uh, it's a unique approach that we take and, and uh, the, the niche process is something that uh, as far as just focusing on multifamily insurance is something that's really helped us grow. And, and I'm just fortunate enough to be a part of it. And, and being that that's all I do, I feel like um, it gives me an advantage as far as um, just being in the space every day and, and working with investors like yourselves um, really knowing what you guys are looking for is, or more so probably what lenders are looking for and making sure we guys we cover you guys properly. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks for the intro. So today, obviously, we're going to talk about uh, insurance for multifamily properties. And I, I think that this is not something that you would typically talk about on a podcast or at least for passive investors because you really don't need to get into the weeds as a passive investor to know about insurance. But I do think it's important that people understand it at a high level. So can you tell us what some of the difference between a standard single family home policy or a primary home policy versus a multifamily policy is? Yeah. So uh, I guess you can start with the, with the basics as far as your, your standard homeowners or primary home policy versus a multifamily policy. I mean, both of them are going to cover you. The main idea is to cover the structure of the property that you own. So to cover against fires and, and different sorts of hazards, things like that. As far as the differences are concerned, the main thing you're going to see between or the differences between a standard home policy and a uh, multifamily commercial policy is on the liability side. Now, as a homeowner or a standard you know, homeowner's policy, um, you're mostly looking at a personal liability, which pretty much covers the, the owner inside the home. Whereas on a commercial package or what we call a business owner's policy or BOP, which we insure the majority of our multifamily properties with, um, the general liability is a lot more expansive and will cover, um, you know, third party um, tenants, slip and falls, personal injury, things like that. It's, it's more designed for, you know, businesses versus, you know, your personal liability aspect. So uh, it's, it's, it's pretty generic as far as the answer is concerned, but um, that's the main thing on the liability side, whereas the property, it's pretty basic as far as what we cover, fire and, and things like that. Um, but uh, the liability, you'll see the, the, the major differences as far as the commercial side being more expansive and covering things like tenants, trip, slip and falls and, and things of that nature. Okay, so when someone's out there looking for coverage, are all, all insurance com- companies kind of covering the same things or are, are certain... Uh, insurance companies better than others? That's a good question. So for the most part, as far as what I do in in, uh, the multifamily side of things, um, we format all our policies with whatever carrier to to meet any 
um, Freddie or Fannie, uh, HUD, whatever lender you're using requirements. So we always format our policies uh, in a similar structure. Some carriers, each carrier has their own little nuances. But one thing when you work in the multifamily space, depending on what state you're in, if you're using, um, um, you know, regional carrier on the West Coast that's an admitted market, um, you're, they all use the same what we call industry standard or ISO forms, where um, most of the coverages are are very similar. Um, they're with this, like I said, small minor nuances. But for the most part, um, the way that we structure our policies are very similar. Um, in the sense that you have your standard building coverage, your you know your personal property or um, and your rental income, as well as the liability side. So there are differences amongst carriers, but the way that we operate and I operate is that I, I try to format them all similarly. It just depends on different property, the different uh, region, as far as what carrier I'd present in a particular situation. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so let's just say from the lender perspective, because you mentioned earlier that you also work with the lender and let's say mm -hmm. someone goes with agency debt versus a small bank loan or a, a, a regional bank. Are there going to be different mm -hmm. requirements between the two? And are there certain things that maybe you should look out for if you're going with a regional bank that may not require what, you know, a Freddie and a Fannie would require you to have? Yeah, exactly. You kind of hit the nail on the head there at the end, as far as Freddie and Fannie or HUD there, they'll have, typically a lot uh, stricter and tighter guidelines as far as what they require on the insurance side than your, than your local bank. Um, a couple of the main items I'd look out for if you're working with a, a smaller bank that might not have as tight of a restrictions on, on the insurance is number one, your uh, an, a coverage item uh, that we call ordinance or law coverage. I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with that, but there's three lines in ordinance or law. There's coverage A, coverage B, coverage C. Um, Coverage A, just to give you a quick synopsis, covers the undamaged portion of a building. So if you have a fire and uh, half of the building goes down um, and you're forced to rebuild the whole building because the one side, the undamaged side of the building isn't up to code, and in order to get the damaged side up to code, you have to rebuild the undamaged side. That is where Coverage A would come into effect. And to all uh, Fannie Freddie requires that Coverage A is included up to the building limit that you have listed on the policy. Coverage B is for demolition, so to demolish that undamaged side, that is cover where coverage B would kick in, and Fannie or Freddie all require that to be 10% of the building limit. And coverage C um, is increased cost of construction, where uh, basically kicks in over the period of time of the rebuild. Um, if there's increased cost of construction, that would kick in. And that's also required by Fannie and Freddie HUD, 10% uh, of the building value. Now, where your regional bank um, might not require ordinance or law, which is why I bring that up. Another thing uh, that I've seen um, in regards to regional versus a Fannie or Freddie requirement is the insurable value that we um, uh, insure the property to. So a lot of times regional banks or smaller banks only require whatever uh, loan is left on the property um, or that you owe to the bank. Um, and sometimes that's a lot less than what the building is actually, insur the insurable value of the building is or the replacement cost. Fannie or Freddie will usually do or take whatever appraisal is done and, and use the replacement cost um, estimate, uh, which is sometimes far above or exceeds the, the purchase price or whatever um, is current, the collateral currently on the building. So those are a couple of the main points that I would look out for, especially if you use a regional bank. Um, ordinance law is a must coverage, especially if you're buying. Uh, older properties that might not be up to code. If you have a fire and you don't have that coverage, the insurance company will rebuild what was damaged, but or not up to code. Like, or you you won't have those expenses to build up to code without that coverage. Okay, got it. That's uh, really important to know. So that's that's awesome. So you also mentioned working with the lenders as far as um, underwriting is concerned. You guys underwrite the deals as well, correct? From an so insurance standpoint. We yeah, so we do do a little bit of that as a broker, but our job mainly is to set you up with an insurance company um, that does the underwriting. So our job is to take, you know, Kyle, for example, the what you and I have worked together, you looked at a couple new purchases. You give me, you know, you say, hey, I'm looking at this deal. You give me an OM that has, you know, two properties, the property information. My job is essentially to uh, 
portray your new purchases or what you're looking at to the insurance company and allow them, um, provide them with the information to underwrite the account and price it. Um, we do, the amount of business we do as far as multifamily is concerned does give us um, some sway as far as underwriting. And honestly, we do underwriting in-house ourselves before we market it. But ultimately, the final say is the insurance company's job, and they underwrite the account per their guidelines. Every every insurance company has different filings within different states. So they are, and their rate structures are, are filed with the state. A lot of people don't know that. I mean, so... Um, our job, yeah, we do do in-house underwriting as far as the insurance is concerned, but um, more so the underwrite, the final say goes to the underwriters with the insurance companies. And our job uh, is to work on your guys' behalf in, in order to get you the best price for the best coverage possible. Okay. And is their underwriting pretty similar to what a Freddie and Fannie would underwrite? The reason I'm asking this is because the other day I was talking to a friend of mine and he brought up a great point is that, you know, you're going to underwrite a deal and then you're going to send it off to the lender. The lender is going to underwrite the deal and the insurance is going to underwrite the deal. So technically, you have two other people kind of backing what you're saying, and they will tell mm-hmm. you, hey, this is not right. This doesn't look right. Uh, your proceeds aren't going to be there or whatever it may be. Um, so you kind of have that safety net in the lender's underwriting and the insurance underwriting. It, are they underwriting pretty similar to one another? Uh, you know, I, I can't say. I, I, I'm not familiar enough with how – you guys work on your end and, and as far as lender underwriting is concerned, I do know that there it's different in the sense that the insurance company is not looking at, um, you know, the property as an investment standpoint as the lender is. The insurance company is looking at, hey, is this risk going to make me money and am I not going to have to pay out anything from claims or any losses? And so they look at things like, you know, where, you know, where is this property located and comparison to brush scores in the area or how close is it compared to the coast what year built is it what's the electrical system what's the you know what kind of what's the crime scores of the area um versus you know what uh, you know a lender might be underwriting or you guys underwrite to is looking at you know what's my insurance costs and how you know the returns aspect it's it's a little different in that sense um and that, so i can only really speak to the insurance side of things and the underwriting involved um, those are some of the key components that they all look at and take into effect and ultimately need to decide for themselves, is this a good investment for me? Am I going to make money on this in the long run uh, or not? Okay, got it. So um, we're going through a deal right now where uh, we're doing a Freddie deal and we've been asked to get additional insurance, so like an umbrella policy. Can you talk about the difference mm-hmm. between or what an umbrella policy is versus what just a standard policy would be? Yeah, so on typical business owner's policy or commercial package, um, which most apartments, if not all apartments are on across the country, is the type of policy structure. You have your property and your general liability. General liability um, limits are typically $1 million per occurrence, $2 million aggregate. So any slip and fall or any liability claim that you have throughout the year, you have $1 million uh, per occurrence and then no more than two million aggregate for the policy period year. An umbrella policy is excess liability. So you purchase that to go on top of your uh, liability, primary liability, that one million, two million I just mentioned. Um, This is typically, you see this more more so um, in the umbrella liability limits being higher on property owners that have multiple policies or have multiple property on uh, multiple properties on one policy, because that one million, two million dollar limit as the properties expand starts to seem a lot less than if you have just one property. Uh, but um, going back to the question, umbrella or an, in other words, an excess liability policy simply extends your general liability or your primary liability up to the limit. So, say you have a claim, a slip and fall, somebody you know trips and hurts themselves and blames you files a suit, um, filed a claim with the insurance company, and they it ends up being a, a you know $3 million claim, whereas you only have $1 million per occurrence, a $2 million aggregate, um, you'd be out of funds, and you'd have to, at that point, pay out of pocket. That's where your umbrella would kick in, is once that primary limit is exhausted, the umbrella then comes in and um, then covers you from that point on. Okay. And is there a standard rule of thumb, depending on the size of your property, as far as how large you go with that umbrella? 
Uh, at this point, it's depending. Well, I know Fannie and Freddie has um, pretty strict guidelines as far as I have a client clients that uh, range anywhere from you know just starting out or 250 units up to to 10,000 units. And um, I have clients that I've started with at 2,500 units, and they had a $10 million umbrella across the entire portfolio. But as they expanded, and um, the bank started to Fannie and Freddie started to require us to bump up to 15 to million based off the number of units and the number of stories per property. Um, so I don't, I'm not exactly sure the exact nuances of the requirements, but um, standard Fannie and Freddie requirement for you know a standalone um, apartment complex that's less than 100 units or so is that one million, two million dollar primary GL with a one million dollar above, which would give you essentially three million total in liability. Um, I recommend, obviously, being on the insurance side, I'm more risk averse, so I, I'd always recommend a minimum of a $5 million limit. Sometimes, um, honestly, you can find cheaper options for the $5 million limit than depending on the deal, um, because there are specialty umbrella programs out there that will offer $5 million limits at the minimum, but those are oftentimes cheaper than if you use um, your, you know, your property and liability carrier to use to purchase an umbrella policy if that makes sense mm -hmm. but uh yeah so there's there's it's it, depending on the account and the property there's different requirements but i for you kyle and you guys starting out i'd recommend you know a minimum of a five million dollar I, I mean you obviously in my position i've seen <laughs> you see quite a few claims in in especially in the multifamily th side of things slip and falls are more common than you think and people get a lot more money than you'd think they'd get. And so I always recommend higher the limit, the better. Um, obviously, on your guys' side, the money has to make, or the, the premium has to make sense for what you guys are underwriting too. So, but that's, that's kind of what I'd recommend. Okay. And so if, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit and go towards like an active investor standpoint. At what point should they be getting you involved uh, in a, in a property when they have an LOI signed, when they're looking at the property prior to that, when they have a contract? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I have clients that are across the, across the board when it comes to, to looking at new purchases. I have, um, guys that are out there in every deal they see, whether they put an offer down on it or not, they'll send me what they're looking at. Hey, can you give me you know, an indication on this based off the region or, or, you know, what can we expect to pay? Um, I have guys that uh, uh, will send me, you know, they won't send me the OM until they are awarded the deal. Um, the way I operate and our firm operates is, you know, we're more than happy to take a look at, you know, properties that you guys are looking at, wherever it might be, whether or not you've been awarded the deal yet. Um, however, at that point, we usually will just review current properties we've written in the area and give you an estimate versus actually underwriting the deal. When I really go to work and where, you know, our stars really will shine is when you guys win the deal and then we can go to work and get you guys um, um, an actual quote um, and hopefully put the price where you guys need it to be. Okay. And, you know, based off experience from some of the stuff that we've talked about in the past, how can investors avoid any like uh oh moments when they get insured on a property, they're going to close it. And let's just say they do close it. And then you inspect the property. And now there's all these things that the insurance is going to require them to upgrade. Is there something they can mm -hmm. do in advance? Because I think unless you've been uh, experienced in it and you've gone through it before, there may be a whole slew of things that you don't think would need to be required from an insurance standpoint that are going to need to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's actually something we've been seeing um, more and more in the insurance side of things as far as inspections are concerned. And insurance companies are, are really, really tightening down as far as their inspections and what they're requiring of, of the people they insure, or the owners that they insure. You know, 10 years or so, or so ago, um, insurance companies would, would inspect, and they still inspect, and they'd, they'd give you, you know, their recommendations, but they'd be exactly that recommendations these days you're seeing insurance companies give you recommendations but those recommendations are actually requirements and that's one thing i'd say is is uh kudos to you kyle for being so in tune with it because um um that has been a pin, pain point for me as an agent the last couple of years and having to deal with owners like yourself who actually have owned 
you know, properties for, for years, um, switching insurance companies and having to up, upgrade things that they've never had to upgrade before. Um, as far as what to look out for, I think the biggest piece of advice that I could give any investor is to find yourself a broker or an agent that you trust that knows not only the market and, but also what every insurance company's underwriting guidelines are and what they're going to require update and what they're not. And then to proceed accordingly. I mean, we've had several conversations, Kyle, about, you know, whether it's from railings, electrical systems and, and whatnot. And we've um, had conversations about, Hey, we have an insurance company here who might charge you 10% less than this insurance company, but they're going to make you, uh, you know, repair X, Y, and Z. And this insurance company is not. Um, so honestly, it's, it's, Every deal is different. Every property is different. Every insurance company is different in what they require. And so my biggest piece of advice would, would be to, to find an agent you trust that you know, knows the market, knows the guidelines for each insurance company, and isn't going to put you in a situation where you're going to have, you know, an unforeseen situation as such that is going to put you in a, in a, in a tough spot. Okay. And then one thing for people to know uh, from an active standpoint is that just because the insurance requires this now or says it's okay now does not mean a year, two, three years later, they're not going to require you to upgrade something that they may have already approved. So you definitely need to look out for that. And I don't know if you can talk a little bit to that, Derek. No, that's true. It is true. However, once once you are with an insurance company, I will say, and and you've had you know good success as far as you know claims activity and and, and loss history. Um, after a few years, you know you start to build rapport with the insurance company. Obviously, they're making money off you, and they start to view your account more as a as a profitable account. And so you'll have, and and in my position, I have a lot more leverage when that time does come. If they you know, three years down the road, decide to reinspect and out ask for X, Y, and Z. I can then I have more of a leg to stand on. Whereas they, I was like, hey, you guys have made X amount of money for on this property. I don't. This has never been an issue in the past. So I, I think there is um, some some um, important sort of to have being with the company for a long time. But yes, we are seeing that as well. Companies that have been on accounts for long periods of time. Um, coming back and say and reinspecting and saying hey we need you guys to do this so it is a possibility and it is uh, it does happen but um, the longer you're with one particular company um, you do build you can build you know rapport and obviously you know from a financial standpoint the insurance company will see you guys as much more profitable and therefore give us an opportunity to um, have more leverage as far as what we can you know do with the insurance company compromise or whatnot yeah, that's good to know that you know, even everything's negotiable when it comes to insurance. So um, yep. my last question of the day is, do you have any insurance coverage horror stories you can share with us? <laughs> uh, man, you know, I, I was racking my brain around around this for, for quite a bit. And I've actually, I asked a few colleagues about, you know, some of their stories. And, and I, personally, I don't have anything that I've done, you know, knock on wood that has, uh, I would classify as horror, but I have taken on clients that have been in the midst of what I'd call a horror story for them personally. Um, you'd be surprised, uh, just to kind of give you a scope of the, the insurance brokerage marketplace as, as, it, as it is, it's an archaic system. So most insurance brokerages are, you know, brokers aren't just specialized in one um one facet of any type of business. So they might take on a construction company one day, apartment the next, or, you know, X, Y, Z, mom and pop shop down the road the third day. Um, and so you, you start to see that when the market shifts with a multifamily insurance, which it does frequently, um, owners find themselves in tough spots if they're using that type of broker. I had a situation last year as an apartment in Texas, apartment owner, where I came in and they had, um, I just, it was a referral and they had been with their agent for quite a long time. Um, just a local agent down in Dallas and, um, they had been on this one program for, and they had like a $5,000 deductible, um, really low, uh, deductibles, you know, strong policy. However, in Dallas, Texas, if you know anything about it, it's one of the worst um, performing, um, cities as far as multifamily insurance is concerned from a loss ratio in, in the country with the hailstorms there and mm. they didn't 
they didn't uh, they didn't experience any hailstorm or any no loss. But with the way the market was, every insurance company that was offering flat five thousand dollar deductibles were getting off of either offering getting off of multifamily their properties altogether or jacking up their deductibles. So I I actually came in with four days prior to the renewal and they had just been served with a, a renewal that their insurance company was was moving their five thousand dollar deductible up to a hundred thousand dollar deductible and um it's just moments like that where that traditional broker down the street didn't know where else to go because he'd been using the same company on all his apartments down the street the last 10 years and with three bad years of hail claims that insurance company ceases to exist it's the same thing um in california with the fires um, there's a couple of regional carriers that went insolvent um, because most of their book was, uh, you know, disintegrated in the fire. So it, it, that's another advantage to having a broker that specializes in it. They, you know, the market's ever changing and you want somebody that knows, hey, or is first in line, honestly, when a new company comes in and another company exits. But that's kind of an example of a horror story that I see more frequently than you think um, as far as, you know, just in the marketplace and, and knowing what's 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 coming online and what's going offline and who's what companies have taken hits and and what what companies have been profitable and so the out there for an investor is to look for a company that has been profitable and that has not taken hits in that specific uh, uh problem yeah that that'd be a safe assumption yes and that okay. again that's that's my job that's what aligning yourself with the broker that knows kind of just knows the market knows what companies are 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 you know stable what companies are financially you know you know strong and um and go from there got it all right great well lolita is going to take us into our final four questions are you ready absolutely all right all right let's drive uh, right in derek what is the one tool that you use in real estate investing that you could not do without well, I'm I'm not quite as uh, as tuned in the real estate investing as as you guys are, and, and probably most of your listeners being on the insurance side of things. But I can say the one thing as far as the insurance side and what I do is finding myself with a team that makes me be better at what I do and and makes me be able to help you guys better. So whether that's you know your account managers or um, your claim staff, uh, people who are, 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 you know, coming to work every day and going to make you a better person is, and a better pr- at your job is probably the most important tool that I can think of and what I do to help you guys be better at yours. All right, great. Now, I know you don't have a horror story, but how about your biggest mistake um, in the insurance industry that you've uh, been through so far and the main takeaway for our listeners? Yeah, so... You know, as far as the biggest mistake, and I'm thinking about this this question and and how it pertains to what I've done um, since my career started, and I think my biggest mistake is is not doing doing more uh, earlier in my career, um, as far as uh, and being more aggressive um, and uh, not allowing that innate fear that most of us start out with in any career, or whether you haven't, you know. If, and, you know, moving into the multifamily insurance space that you haven't invested before, um, you know, that story that tells you, you know, you don't, you don't know enough or you'll never win that deal. Or, you know, there's too many people that know more than you. How could you ever sell somebody to, to, to work with you? And, you know, being in the industry now for six to seven years, um, if I had taken the mindset that I have now um, back to when I had just started, I I, it, I don't like to think about it because I, I don't know how much further I'd be in my career. So I think I think it applies. I can apply to to you guys and your invest or your listeners. In the sense that you know I don't think you know going into a deal thinking you're going to win um, and not not thinking about the what ifs and uh, um, what what how could I lose this going in with the mindset of how am I going to win this deal versus how can I lose it. Um, and so that would be the biggest mistake I'd say, and that I, I, I strive to, to make sure I don't make um, every day now. Awesome. Uh, what is it that you need to do now to grow your life to the next level? Uh, the way I look at it is I just got to keep grinding um, and as far as um, 
you know, just keep grinding, keep, keep, uh, um, growing my book of business and growing my knowledge and being more, uh, more of a, you know, an asset to you guys versus, you know, uh, just another checkbox or another thing you got to deal with. I think a lot of things that a lot of times I see on your guys in your guys' shoes is people who are just, you know, trying to get a deal done and they're waiting on the insurance guy because he can't get the appropriate documentation to the lender. It just won't fit. Our job and what we do at Rice is our, you know, the way our teams are structured are to, to make the insurance process and system something that you guys never lose sleep over. You just know it's going to be compliant, you're going to be covered, and the price is going to be where you need it to be. And so for me to grow my life to the next level is to just keep grinding and keep being better for you guys. Um, I got, yeah. So that, that's, that's, that's basically um, what I'd have to say for that. Great. We appreciate you. And finally, where can people find out more about you? Well, I, I know in my bio I gave to Kyle, um, I'm on LinkedIn under Derek Dickerson. I work for Rice Insurance. You can find us online at riceinsurance.com. Um, uh, I believe my email, I don't know if you'll be able to post that onto the, uh, the podcast for your listeners, but uh, yeah, if, perfect. Yeah. If any, anybody out there is, uh, you know, your listeners are looking at, you know, purchasing multifamily properties or you simply just have questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, Kyle put my number on there. Um, an open ear. Um, we got, you know, we have several, several, uh, you know, people on our team that'd be more than willing to help you guys and uh, um, you guys' journey uh, in multifamily investing. Yeah, if you want, go ahead and uh, shoot out your uh, shout out your uh, phone number and uh, email right now too. Yeah, uh, my email is Derek, uh, spelled D E R E K, at riceinsurance dot com. Um, my number is three six zero six zero three four three two zero. Perfect. And don't worry, guys, we'll have everything in the show notes. Uh, so thank you for sharing your knowledge with us, Derek. Definitely some great takeaways that all real estate investors could take and apply to their current and future investments. So with that being said, thanks for your time and everyone else. We'll talk to you later. See you, Derek. Thank you, guys. Thank you.